plumbers and mechanics insurance companies. The doors, plant is back in. I've got this wafting <laughs> aroma of uh, looks like a giant cinnamon roll. Joe Kinzer is our guest here on the program. Uh, wants to uh, be the next prosecuting attorney in Berkeley County. And if this is the way he goes about his business, I and, can see success for this young man in the future. And Rob, there are two of them. Look at the size of this thing. Well, there's, there's two. There's quite another two of them. Two. Well, it well, started off in I, that way. Yeah, you and I kind of got into that one. <laughs> it started as two. The yeah. story began. Yeah. The word has gone out. These guys are working an extra hour. They need fed. <laughs> and the word has been successfully distributed along with the feeding. What is this, and, Joe? And, What's that? Where, where'd you get this? Uh, Twisty Doze. Twisty Doze. Yep, Edwin what, Miller Boulevard. What is it like? A, is that like a pound of uh, <laughs> I, of, of cinnamon roll? I, it was. It, it. My arm was sore carrying those two things those. in here. Yeah, two of those. That, they, that is an impressive baked good. They add up, and they're <laughs> delicious too. I They've highly recommend be. them. And and Maria's been pushing this scenario that bring food, bring food. The more you bring, the better you are. <laughs> now, Joe, let me tell you the difference between when you bring food in and when Bill brings food in. <laughs> if, if Bill would have brought this in. You could see like a mouth-shaped bite mark <laughs> and two fingerprints on the sides, yeah. right? Like hand marks. Yeah. And he'd have brought him, Rob, I had some of this leftover cinnamon roll for you, and that's how it would look. That's but you brought them in unscathed. Unscathed, yes. Now, I, I mean, maybe I should have Do you have, have one in the them? car that has a couple of bite marks in it? Uh, no comment. Yeah, okay. No uh, comment. Yeah, I understand. Uh, Joe, uh, you've served your time in the Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, and now you'd like the big seat. Talk to me about this journey. It, it's been a long journey, and one of the things that's been great, a, a big positive for me about the campaign is that, you know, for years now, almost a decade, I've been an assistant prosecutor, and you go to work, you do your job, you try to do a good job, you try to be organized, prepared, and, and get the job done and serve the people of the county, um, but it can kind of be thankless a lot of times. You know, you're just going and, and doing your job as a public servant. Um, the reactions and the feedback that I've had during the campaign from people um, who have noticed, you know, who, who paid attention and, and are uh, supportive of me because of what I've done. It, it's been just wonderful personally to, to get those kind of, have those kind of conversations with people and see like, you know, the, the work that I've been doing for years, it's not, it's not gone unnoticed, um, which has been wonderfully uplifting for me. But with that being said, a lot of the people that you work with more closely are precluded for publicly endorsing. Sure. You know, I it, that was one of the most difficult things about this campaign when I started, which was almost a year ago now. We, we really got started in June of last year. Um, you know, when I think if, if I weren't a prosecutor and someone was running for prosecutor, I'd want to ask around and I'd want to ask the judges, you know, who's who, who should I pick for prosecutor? Well, you can't do that. Or even judicial candidates like my boss, uh, Ms. Delaghetti. You're, you're not allowed to ask that. What about probation officers? They work directly for the court. They're, they're in there every day. They see all this stuff happen. They follow, they fall under the same umbrella as the judges because they work for the judges. Uh, individual police officers are prohibited from publicly endorsing any candidate. You know, I would want to know where the police stand on a prosecutor. Um, and so it's been, it's kind of a difficult situation because all the people that you want to ask who would be the best prosecutor they're not allowed to publicly do that now associations can so like i've been endorsed by the west virginia troopers association and the uh, west virginia deputy sheriff's association so uh, i have been able to to get the word out that way uh, because those are not individual officers they're a collective group can of officers. we infer anything about the individual officers based on the association's endorsement well the association is made up of officers so uh, the Troopers Association is made up of troopers, and the Deputy Sheriff's Association is made up of, of deputies. Um, so I, I feel confident that I can say I'm supported and endorsed by law enforcement. I feel very confident to be able to say that. How can the average voter then, Mr. Stedman has been in Pinellas County, Florida, a prosecuting mm -hmm. attorney. Uh, you're currently an assistant prosecuting attorney. How is a voter dis supposed to determine who would be better at the job? Well, one, I'd say look at to who law enforcement picks. Um, but at law enforcement in this area, uh, you know, the difference is my service has been here. Uh, I'm plugged in here and now, not 20 years ago, a thousand miles away. Um, and that difference is, is drastic. The job and the cases and the evidence and the technology that we use has changed so much just in the 10 years that I've been doing this um that 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 relevancy of that uh recent 
active participation and being being plugged in with the individuals who do this work. And, and an example of that is I think I mentioned maybe the first time I was on this show is that when something happens in the county and that investigator picks up the phone and they call the prosecutor, you're going to want me on the other end of that phone. Why? And because I know how to handle these investigations. I've done, uh, you know, murder. I, I've, give, give us an example of investigation that you've been on yep. that you, you concluded to a successful end. Oh, so many of them. I, I've, I've convicted eight murderers in this county uh, during my time as an assistant prosecutor. And several of them, the one in particular that sticks out to me is the murder of Taylor Hockridge in 2014. Uh, that was a murder where law enforcement worked the case and there were multiple people involved, but the only person they were able to identify through their investigation was the driver of the getaway car. Now, I prosecuted her for her part in the murder. She was the getaway driver. And we convicted her of murder because when you're working with someone to murder someone else, you're still guilty of murder even if you don't pull the trigger. That's how the law works. So, but we didn't stop there. I, after that trial, went with the investigators. We went to Elkins. We met with that, uh, her name was Nastasia Powell, who was convicted as the getaway driver. And we worked with her and we debriefed her and got more information that we then followed up on. State police went out with metal detectors where she said they threw the gun. This was after she was convicted of murder, but she told us this and went out and state police found the murder weapon. We were able to get that to our lab and match it to the shell casings at the scene of the murder. Uh, but aside from that, I had learned in the meantime about the technology involving cell phone towers and what kind of data we can get from cell phone towers. And I worked with the investigators. I, I can't sign the search warrants, but I, I contacted the FBI and uh, dealt with some connections that I had there and was able to get the data from the cell phone towers in the area that was able to piece back together what actually happened that night, who all was involved. We could see where people's cell phones were. Uh, which was something that the investigators themselves weren't aware of as a possibility uh, that I was able to bring to the table. We then used, um, uh, again, from our office, we got search warrants for social media accounts, and we were able to get conversations between the other people involved in the murder regarding the murder. And we were ultimately able to, years later, go in and prosecute the other two individuals involved, and they were both convicted of first-degree murder and received life without mercy. And it's hard as a public servant to toot your own horn, but I can tell you that would not have happened if I was not on that case. Maria. So you said you've convicted eight murderers in this county. Over what period of time, Joe, are we talking about? We'd be talking about, I think my first murder, which was Miss um, Powell's case, was I believe in 2017. Okay. And um, actually my, not the most recent murder conviction, but the one before that, uh, involving uh, Rita Hendershot. She was the defendant. She shot and killed her um, her ex-husband. And uh, that case was another one where it was such a hard case. It, it wasn't a whodunit. It, we knew who did it. We just had to prove it wasn't an accident. And that's incredibly difficult to do. Uh, and we were able, myself and Katie, to piece through and comb through all of this phone data, you know, stuff that 10 years ago was not not as evidentiary as it is now. I mean, now everyone carries their phones, they have everything in their phones, and we have the ability to get that data and use it as evidence. And uh, that's been one of the, the big parts of, of the big cases that I have. My understanding of that technology and my ability to use it to piece together a case and prosecute. And that one was actually um, just the other week, um, Discovery, uh, Investigation Discovery. Uh, they have a show called American Monster, which is a documentary, docuseries thing that they do. And um, they are doing an episode on that case. So I got to uh, interview and be part of that documentary with uh, Katie. And I think it's supposed to come out later in the summer. But uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that case because being, having to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what was going on between someone's ears when something happened is is incredibly difficult and i and i think we had maybe 15 witnesses in that case multiple experts about domestic violence it was a very unique case in which the the defendant the uh the female was absolutely a, a domestic abuser in that relationship and uh the decedent the victim he he didn't want to didn't want to talk about that he didn't go get help he didn't reach out for help because i i believe of the stigma of 
uh, as a man being a victim of domestic abuse, uh, he didn't want to reach out. And uh, unfortunately, it ended in his death. So make sure you let us know when that's on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sure. I will. We'll let you know. So of these eight cases, you were the lead prosecutor in those cases. Is that what you're saying? Or you worked with someone else? Because I know you. Sure. there's usually a team of the prosecutors, just like a team on the defense side. Absolutely. So. We, we work the buddy system um, for just about every trial nowadays since COVID. It, it actually, that happened because we had a, um, a jury trial scheduled and the night before trial the prosecutor who was going to handle that case tested positive for covid and um i think i may have heard that you may have, you may have heard about that <laughs> so um that was when uh, katie walked in the next day took a file and tried a case and and won uh it, but we didn't want that to happen again we didn't want to have to put another prosecutor in that position so since then we've we've done the buddy system for jury trials and uh, historically, even before Katie's administration, the elected prosecutor handles the murders in Berkeley County. You know, this is not a position where the elected prosecutor just sits behind a desk and points and delegates everything. You got to lead by example in Berkeley County. And so uh, Katie, Katie is on every murder. Uh, so those eight murder trials I have tried with Katie, except for that first one, um, which I tried with Hassan Rashid, an assistant prosecutor in our office. And how many people, how many assistant prosecutors are in the office? What's the delegation of duties as you see it sure. now and how you would delegate um, if you're elected? Certainly. So right now, active in the office, we have 13 assistant prosecutors. We have uh, two who do exclusively child abuse and neglect, um, which, I, you know, I think I mentioned at the candidate forum that used to be a one prosecutor docket. It's probably even more than a two prosecutor docket right now. As of yesterday, we have 118 abuse and neglect cases already for this year. It's May. Um, so those two uh, handle that. We have a dedicated juvenile delinquency and juvenile status offense uh, prosecutor, Ms. Seville, um, Shannon Kaiser in our office also handles some of the juvenile cases and handles a lot of forfeitures and things like that. And then we have um, three, right now, we have three prosecutors who handle magistrate court. So right now there's six magistrates and each of those prosecutors has two magistrates and they uh, work every case that goes through both felony prelims and misdemeanor cases, which stay in magistrate court. Um, and then the rest of us handle felonies uh, of varying levels. You know, a felony in West Virginia is anything that that can get you over a year uh, incarceration. And those sentences are served in prison instead of jail. That's the distinction in our law. And, and the rest of us handle handle those. And, and like I said, they they vary. There are myself and um, really Ray Boyce handles uh, some murders with Katie as well. Uh, and we've got a, a great team that, that we work with over there. Yeah, talking about team, uh, we hear so much about the uh, the high-profile events, but everything comes down to office management. Uh, Katie has received high marks for office management. What role have you played in the office management up to this point in time? Oh, yes. Well, and, you know, that's the that's the far less sexy part of the job, but it's like you pointed out, it's that's the real day-to-day, -day, right, is office management. And uh, I've established myself uh, as a leader within the office. Katie, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of the administration, so I'm the senior assistant. Um, it used to be, the title used to be the chief assistant. We changed the name of it. Um, but it means the same thing. So when, when Katie's not there, you know, I, I fill in, I handle uh, administrative stuff within the office, I handle HR stuff within the office, I uh, have already a great relationship established with the commission, I help Katie prepare the budgets um, when there's, you know, if there's difficulties, if we have to talk to an employee about something, you know, we, we generally try to do that together, I've been a part of all of that process, and I've been able to see how she does it and what what she has brought that has been, you know, so successful and that's just that that quiet and steady professionalism that she has brought to that office and i know that you know whoever gets elected prosecutor is going to be the boss there but there's a difference between that and and someone 
who has earned the respect of the office and the support of the office and who they trust. I mean, there these other assistant prosecutors are in my office every day asking, what, what should I do about this? How should I go about this? You know, should I file this or that? And uh, I, I feel like a large part of my day is helping them and helping, especially some of these younger prosecutors, teach them the right way to do things. And, and they're just, they're great. We have a wonderful group of prosecutors there. Joe Kinzer, our guest here on the program. Bill, did you have a follow-up? Well, it's, uh, one of the chat room uh, asked a question, said, and one of the, I think, way you judge the success of your of your office uh, would be the number of convictions. The question in the chat room, there have been a lot of plea deals, mm -hmm. a reason. Was that driven uh, to drive the conviction rates up, or was that driven by because legitimate purposes. Does a plea deal count toward a conviction rate? It does. It, okay. it does. Now, a conviction rate per se is not really something that that we keep track of. I can't tell you how many convictions we have and, and for what this year. Um, and, and that's kind of a misconception, I think, that people might get from TV and, and video and stuff like that in movies is that we care about that conviction rate. I, I care about justice. You know, if, if justice is that this person needs to be convicted of, of everything that's in the indictment and get the max. And there are people that are like that. You know, there are some folks that unfortunately you can't fix. Um, then that's what we do. And that's what we push for. Uh, other times, you know, there are people, especially with the, the substance abuse issues that we have in this area, um, there are a lot of people that you don't look at it that way. You look at it as what can we do to make sure that this person gets on the right track and doesn't keep doing this. Because if you just lock somebody, okay, we got a conviction because they stole something from a, a Walmart. We got a conviction. We put them in jail for 90 days. Well, now we've paid for them to be in jail for 90 days. They're going to get out. They still have that same issue that was driving them, that ruining their lives, ruining their families. Um, and they're going to be back again. And the uh, having Berkeley County having all these resources that we have now that we didn't have when I started as a prosecutor, you know, uh, adult and juvenile drug court, day report center, home confinement, they were nothing like they are now. And I, I will also say this, those, those programs have saved, you know, Berkeley County. Uh, I think uh, DRC is an average of day report center is an average of three to $5 million a year that wow. it saves uh, home confinement around $2 million a year. But I ask you, you know, Tim Sire runs those, um, you know, ask him, ask anybody over there, if they didn't have complete buy-in from the Berkeley County Prosecutor's Office, if we weren't committed to the same goal, they would not have had the success that they've had. Same thing with drug court and everything else. Well, those complain about the previous prosecuting I, attorney. I was going to say that. Yeah. I had the, I had the uh, work with the previous prosecutor, and there's a lot, there's a major difference in the attitude between Katie and her predecessor. Yes. And, Kate, and the, her predecessor did not really want to get involved in these programs you just referred to. Yep. Well, and I think too, Joe, you make the point when we're talking about plea bargains and stuff, and what I don't think, because we have a limited view of what, um, what we know of from television, whatever video, like you said, there are so many pieces to a case. Yes. It's not just the prosecutor says, oh, yeah, well, OK, we'll we'll do a plea bargain. Sure. Here. I mean, you've got the police um, giving you the evidence. And if the police don't think that they have a solid case, then right. you're left with that saying, "Ooh, what are we going to do here? Joe, yeah. I got to jump in because we've got about uh, 60 seconds oh, sure. left. And I want to oh. give that time to you to tell <laughs> folks why they should vote for you for prosecuting attorney. Sure. Thank you. So. I'm asking for your vote to be the next prosecutor. I'm tough and fair and an experienced prosecutor right here in Berkeley County. I've devoted nearly the last decade of my life to trying to keep Berkeley County safe and serve the people here. And I'm asking for the opportunity as the elected prosecutor, uh, to, it would be a seamless transition for me to move forward and lead this office into the future. And I know I am the only candidate that can do that. Uh, and I'm going to just get back very, very quickly if I have a couple seconds uh, on pleas, because I completely agree, you know, not every case is perfect. And there are several reasons why someone can get charged with a crime, but we may not have the evidence to convict them. And I would also encourage people to look at what the sentences are on some of these pleas. You know, we just finished our organized crime indictment from uh, last year. Uh, it is finally resolved and uh, everyone took a plea and those folks are in jail for decades. Joe, thanks so much for coming in. For usual candidates, uh, there's a website where they have their information up about themselves. Do you have one? Absolutely. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram, uh, Joe Kinzer for Prosecutor, but I have a website, joekinzerforprosecutor.com. Please check it out, and I ask for your vote on May 14th. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. 
Early voting ends May 11, and uh, that gives you one more Saturday to get some early voting done today, too. We have a minute 